Hi, and welcome to Yankin Scott on Risk, the YouTube channel dedicated to the theory and practice of risk management. In this video, I'm going to um, present a talk I gave for uh, the Center of Finance uh, School of Business Economics and Law at the University of Gothenburg on their Enterprise Risk Management Conference, February 2020. I was asked to elaborate on how to find value in enterprise risk management. That was the theme of this um, ERM conference. So here's what I, in this video, I will then um, present my, my, my answer to that question. And um, please find more uh, on finding value in, in enterprise risk management in my book, Empowered Enterprise Risk Management, co-authored with uh, Peter Capstar. There's also more information on my website, website riskbudgeting.se. And as they say here on YouTube, please like and subscribe. So my initial observation here is that it was always uh, kind of hard to make a business case for risk management. If you think about how, you know, um, what, what managers look for when they are presented with a proposition, right? They want to, to understand how that benefits the bottom line. And there has to be a fairly clear and convincing case for that. Whereas risk management doesn't always have that to offer. It's more like we can, um, help you make better decisions and we can trade off risk and return better, um, more abstract, and perhaps vague benefits that are more long run in nature. Uh, and um, so that becomes a problem when you want to uh, make the case for risk management then. And in fact, we have a situation where whenever risk management, you know, do help avoid certain bad outcomes and disasters, et cetera, then, then um, those are never seen right. These are things that didn't happen. So they are the unsung heroes in that respect. Whenever things go well, nobody can be bothered to thank the risk manager, right? And, and um, but whereas the costs for risk management, if you propose a risk mitigation action, that is costly. You, you most, in most cases, you have to pay up front, you know, to invest in, in some kind of risk mitigation that will affect the bottom line in perhaps a, a way that is not um, well received. So yeah, it, it is uh, somewhat problematic then. And uh, whereas when things do, uh, you know, turn out badly for the worse, you know, then uh, that will be perhaps coming back to, to um, be a problem for, for the risk managers because, you know, why didn't they do anything? Well, why are you, are, do we find ourselves in this situation? And, and they, this, it's completely out of the context in which the decision was made. Maybe there was a perfect uh, decision support, you know, for that, and, and everyone agreed that this was an acceptable risk, and we are going to proceed like this. You know, the, that context is soon forgotten, and when something bad happens, it's always like, why didn't someone think about this, you know? And, and so that's another problem, built-in problem for risk managers. That, uh, and that we see many times, you know, when, for example, derivatives that are, are you know perhaps sensibly designed to mitigate some important risk, but after, you know, the, they materialize and become cash settled, you know, then, then it's more about, did the company make or lose money on it? And if we lost, why, you know, that was a, why, why do we have this <laughs> very unfortunate outcome? But all right, so yeah, that, it was never easy. Uh, let's see if we can um, make some progress here in terms of, of finding value then. Um, to, to start off, we want or need some definition here of risk management. We, we're going to go for the COSO 2004 definition, which is um, a widely circulated and, and um, you know, that's how many relate to risk management through this definition. So we see here that there's a number of uh, concepts involved. Enterprise risk management is supposed to be uh, supervised by the board of directors. There's, uh, it takes place in a strategy setting across the whole enterprise. We're supposed to manage risk to bring it into, uh, you know, align it with uh, a risk appetite, so-called. And we are going to use all of this to make sure that there's a reasonable assurance that, that objectives are met. So this is the ERM package uh, as per the COSO document, right? So let's take a look at some of these. Uh, first, there's the notion that it helps achieve targets and objectives which sounds reasonable enough, right? That we can identify some of the threats that, that can put this, uh, these objectives at risk and do something about them. 
then we sort of uh, increase the likelihood that we meet important objectives. And once we get attention to those threats, we can devise a response, you know, do something about it and, and have a better outcome then in terms of uh, meeting these objectives. And uh, I mean, most people find objectives worth their while, so to speak, that, that's uh, an important uh, aspect of business, right? And, and uh, so it doesn't perhaps seem like there's much to object to that, you know? And, and if we can help achieve objectives, well, there's value in that. Well, not so fast. I mean, uh, we have to remember that these targets, they're often targets, you know, and, and are, are supposed to critical thresholds, you know, some actual, you know, <laughs> in consequence, you know, they, they are rather part of a, a framework called uh, managing, management by objectives in which headquarters and business areas negotiate some targets to, for, for the units to be met uh, in the next, over the next 12 months or so. And that provides accountability and motivation. The business units will start to strive towards that and, and enhance performance in that process. So it's an aspirational thing rather. And the real reason why they have such a apparently important place in ERM uh, as observed today is perhaps simply because people really want to meet these targets so as to cash in on various bonuses. You know, you have this uh, performance linked pay and, and fulfilling these KPIs are an important part of that process, right? So, so people have very strong personal in incentives to, you know, make sure that these targets are, are met because that's when they can collect their, um, claim that the KPIs are met and collect their bonuses, right? So, so uh, all right, so whereas then, having such a such targets in place can actually distort risk management incentives because if you're pursuing a target and you're on the right side of it you become risk averse you want to protect it and engage in all sorts of risk management perhaps even when it means spending money and not receiving a, a benefit that is proportionate it's simply about safeguarding this um, target now and, and make sure you don't fall back below it so then that's a form of over-management of risk. Whereas if you're on the wrong side of the target and still pursuing it, your opposite uh, incentives are, are strictly opposite of that, right? You, you're, you now have incentives to gamble and, and take a lot of risk to have a chance of, of meeting the target. And the more you're, you're looking to, to be underperforming relative to the target, the stronger your incentives are to gamble. And uh, that's under-management of risk, if you, if you want to call it that. I mean, you're, you're not... You're going to push forward more aggressively and, and, and uh, take risks that are potentially reckless, right? So that's under management of risk. So, and you can take it one step further than that these uh, targets may in fact be a generator of risk. If people are then desperately trying to catch up or, or you know, reaching these targets, they might do these uh, risk enhancing, uh, take risk enhancing actions, you know, that are not appropriate and, and, and pose a, a threat to the firm, you know, the, the long-term interest of the firm. And there are several cases from, from history where we can observe this. British Petroleum, the, the financial incentives were pressuring people to, you know, take shortcuts and, and make judgment calls that were, were not um, the correct one from a, you know, broader, perspective that, that involve the uh, environment and all these factors and, and the company pay for that uh, and, and, and everybody else for that matter. So that is then uh, generated risk rather than, than, you know, as opposed to, as opposed to the uh, not meeting the target being, being risk, you know. So if you want to outline a, a chain of events, you know, a typical uh, pattern here would be something like this. These target pressures, you know, the short-term targets, create a culture of greed in the company. And these aggressive targets push them, you know, even further along that, that line. Uh, that lowers the standards of contact, conduct. People take excessive risks and disasters happen. So that is what, you know, these very strong short-term performance pressures might lead to. You know? so, so maybe that's how we should look at them rather, as potential generators of risk. So that sort of flips the perspective. All right, so risk appetite next. Uh, it's uh, usually pre presented 
in terms of some amount of risk or the amount of risk we're willing and able to accept in pursuit of value creation. Now that sounds intuitively very reasonable and, and at face value, you know, we're, we're prepared to go along with that, you know, why, why not? It seems to make some sense. And as in an ERM context, it's supposed to help us find the right balance between risk and return then. You know, we're supposed to stay within this risk appetite, but, but no further. So, so that risk is sort of contained and uh, we don't um, push it to any extreme levels here. And we get this uh, nice balance between uh, risk and return, right? So, so you're connecting upside potential with risk the way it's supposed to be and not just containing it as maybe earlier versions of risk management seem to present it and, and meaning. Um, all right, so, however, if you look at practice, you know, people seem to be uh, endlessly confused by risk appetite, and, and there are a few success stories uh, out there, I would say, I mean, um, and no, but nobody seems to agree on what it is, it can be pretty much anything, as long as it's vaguely or remotely related to, to risk, it can pass for uh, some kind of risk appetite statement. And all this confusion seems to indicate that we have a problem, right? there's something, a structural problem with the concept itself. And there are plenty to be said for that view, you know, you, you, you're not even supposed to have a risk appetite in one sense because we're in business and business means trading cost against benefit. So, so we're not supposed to have subjective feelings as, as managers, you know, we're, we're supposed to look at this from a professional point of view where, where we see certain benefits and if those are proportionate larger than the cost, you know, and we go ahead with it. If there's a net positive net present value, well, then we, we pursue the project. So it's not about having some subjective vague notion about what, what is our appetite for risk. You know, we, we are not supposed to mix in our, our feelings here. Uh, we're managers running a firm on behalf of somebody else and that the job description is to, to sort of um, pursue value. And, and um, all right, so, yeah, and also a lot of times you see these risk appetites being framed in, in very, very absolute terms, like decision rules that are fixed beforehand and, and sort of, uh, you know, this, there's a disconnect between upside and, and uh, risk in a way that was not intended, I, I suppose, because, um, you know, given how it's presented. So whereas in, in actual reality, we're very much interested in the upside potential, right? And only when we know that can we assess whether or not the risk is, is uh, acceptable. So, and given that the upside is, you know, uh, shifting and changing depending on context and where, the, you know, the information is updated about various uh, markets and, and products, et cetera. So we can't fix the risk appetite in, 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 that, in, in very many cases, you know. So, so you're dealing with a very dynamic situation here and we have to always evaluate on an ongoing basis what the upside potential is. And then we can say something about it. So, so all these attempts at um, fixing the, the risk appetite through some decision rules or, or written policy documents, you know, that then that, that those are bound to be uh, problematic for others. So, and in fact, they make, may make the firm more rigid and bureaucratic. You're, you're trying to uh, go by certain written prescriptions and, and uh, you know, that, that sounds like more bureau bureaucracy to, to my mind, at least. And uh, what, what if the firm ends up being more, uh, you know, slower to respond to opportunities? You know, then you have made a disservice. You have done a disservice to, uh, to shareholders then rather than, rather than creating some kind of value. But it's, of course, uh, highly popular with, uh, with consultants who are, can advise on this and, and it, it never ends because you, you never seem to reach the goal and, and uh, it takes uh, you know, long costly processes to, to, to you know, try to get there. And, and that, well, well how, can, how can that be bad if you're a consultant? Because uh, it does sound important still. You, you, you can certainly sell it to people. And, and you know, so, so that's a good combination for them. So maybe not so much value there either. Um, moving on then to another value proposition, uh, when ERM is about integrated risk management, you know, that, that's supposed to be a real benefit here. If we didn't look at risk management in, in terms of integrated uh, risk, in, you know, an integrated effort at that. It, it, it was mostly about the silos where each department had their sort of uh, risk management activity, if, if any. 
Whereas now we're supposed to look at these net exposures uh, and correlate these risk factors if we can um, and, and do that consistently in a unified way across the enterprise. Uh, and that sounds fantastic, right? Because you now have something that is centralized and coordinated. You trade uh, costs and benefits from an, from an integrated corporate perspective as opposed to these uh, silos, right? So you get rid of all sorts of inefficiencies if you do it this way. And, and uh, there, there are so many promises from this. And, and uh, everyone who hears about them tends to like them because they, they sound good and they are correct, you know, from a theoretical point of view. However, we find that uh, a lot of times in practice, ERM seems to end up being the ultimate silo, the most isolated process of them all, like just a handful of people doing their own thing largely disconnected from the rest of the organization. They, they, they've failed to integrate with the, some of the more important decision-making processes, notably other corporate functions, right? And, and they're not really integrating with the business units either in the sense of uh, together trying to come up with improved decisions. So they're not sort of part of that. So, so they end up being like a collector of, of um, risk data, which, which is then passed on to, uh, to the corporate level, you know, and, and um, so, so they're, they're not really invited or made part of, of the setting in which we make important business decisions. And, and people maybe even resent these new corporate uh, directives and, and, you know, just another round of requirements. So maybe that wasn't, uh, you know, the, the integrated risk management um, Argument doesn't always um, hold up to scrutiny either. So um, moving on, we have the, the next value proposition here that uh, in, it's now in the, where it belongs in a strategic um, kind of setting where, where the, the board of directors is involved. So they are the representatives of shareholders, right? And they're supposed to promote the value creation process in the firm by, by implementing uh, or Making sure that strategies are uh, are in place and and that they are the best uh, the best ones um, that they are in the best interest of the firm. But then there are the risks that that come attached with these strategies, right? And and the board is supposed to take an interest in that as well through the risk oversight. And you know, by taking that active interest in in risk, manager uh, the board the board of directors is uh, able to raise the level of decisions being made with respect to risks, you know, that, that we get um, a risk and return profile now on the strategic level that is, uh, that is better than before. And uh, so that is supposed to be one of the benefits. But what we sometimes find is that things seem to go on just like before. So you assign risk ownership, for example, to uh, to exactly um, the unit that always did that sort of thing anyway. So nothing much really changes. It's like, okay, you guys are no best about that because that's your, your line of business. We'll, uh, you'll be the risk owner. So it just keeps going in its tracks, right? And, and uh, for example, treasury is rarely challenged on foreign exchange risk policy, even in, in uh, integrated forms of risk management. So people can have very advanced ERM programs, but treasury still goes on setting the FX policy as, as they always did. So you don't see much of a change there. So rather from the point of view of directors and managers is something that you just check off, you check off the box. Right? You, you want to be seen doing risk management and therefore being responsible. So, so you try to reach outside expectations that you're today pretty much expected to have some kind of risk management process. Uh, otherwise it would look irresponsible. So with the RM in place and, and you know, you, you have some attention on the main risk uh, through risk ownership and that's a process and we have that now. So, and, th and that's what it amounts to then. There, there's not more, much more interest in it beyond that. So the RM process basically supplies the risk data and st it stops there. You know, once you have the, the information, sufficient risk information to make the claim that, okay, we, we know our top risks and uh, here they are, uh, you put that in the annual report and so maybe we don't find that much value either. And then the strategy setting, uh, if we look closer at, at that, I mean, um, the idea again is that 
through the superior methodology, we're supposed to be able to, you know, enhance the strategy making process, you know, and um, how that gets implemented. And uh, we strike a, an, Im an improved balance between risk and return on the strategic level then. The reality of it in, in many cases seems to be that um, ERM is sort of uh, left out of the strategy process. Uh, if you take something like an um, debt finance acquisition, that's as strategic and, and as, it, as it gets for it. I mean, has, it often has major implications for the firm's uh, portfolio of activities and its strategies and, and its risk, because if they're debt finance, that can seriously increase the level of risk here. And um, so that seems like a place where ERM could step in and, and make a meaningful contribution. But uh, we don't see that. They, they are, are rarely involved in that kind of discussion. And um, another point would be that, well, strategy was always about risk and return. Managers have done that forever. It's what they're there to do. Who, who needs an ERM function to now suddenly inform us how we're supposed to do that? So managers will sometimes frame it in, the, in these terms, right? And um, yeah, and it's true. If, if strategy is risk return in its purest form and managers are supposedly good at that, then where is there a place for, for uh, ERM here to help improve that? Um, and very rarely do ERM take an interest in um, financial, the financial dimension of risk and return. And this happens to be the very language in which uh, most of the organization communicates. We express things in terms of uh, net incomes and cash flows and, and balance sheets and financial ratios. I mean, that's how, you know, where, where all of the attention is, you know, that's how, how the company tries to present itself to the outside world. You know, this dialogue with analysts and investors, that's pretty much done in, in financial terms, you know, to, to, a, to a, large extent and uh, whereas if ERM chooses to be not to be part of that well there then the value is not going to you know their their uh, contribution to value is not going to be uh, helped by that they, they um, they're not part of this dialogue they, they don't they lack the tools and, and the techniques to express risk that way so they gradually become irrelevant to um, senior decision makers so maybe the ER, ERM uh, tenants here didn't fare so well. Uh, those uh, we found in the COSO um, definition of, of ERM at least. And um, uh, but what if what about the academic side of things? Ha haven't academia already concluded that ERM is is a, is a really great thing? Well, we have this study here, seeming seeming to indicate a twenty percent premium in firms that uh, have implemented ERM. So that magically overnight, if you were to implement ERM, there would be a 20% jump in your market capitalization. Now that's a wildly um, you know, unrealistic number if you, if you look at it in that way. And we can't really conclude from these studies that uh, there is a chain of causality going from in ERM implementation to, to value. It, it doesn't work that way that you can you know, just put something called the RM in place and expect the stock market to revise your, your share price up 20%. And, and um, maybe it's the other way around that these the firms choosing to implement the RM are, are um, better to begin with. They have more resources. They're more successful and they have more resources and they can use some of those re resources to, to, buy, to buy ERM. I mean, it's kind of a luxury good in that sense. You, you, you get it when you can afford it. And that could easily explain such a correlation, you know, that uh, val higher value correlates with ERM. So it's endogenous. And you sometimes, you know, find a certain lack of critical thinking in, in many of these studies. It's assumed that ERM is good. So, so the critical thinking that is supposed to, uh, you know, be, be a marker of uh, academic um, knowledge pursuits, you know, you don't always uh, see it. So it's this. Um, for here, for here, for example, uh, you find these uh, very complicated uh, representations of ERM that, that, that somehow is very good, but you don't see, or at least I don't, you know, how that, what that means <laughs> in actual, if you, if you were to translate it to an actual situation. Uh, same here, you, you, all these uh, complicated words uh, in long 
winding sentences and it's all good and endless possibilities. And so maybe the critical thinking is not what it should be in, in some of the quarters in, of academia, you know, and, and uh, we can't just, uh, and, and you can attach ERM to anything, it seems. We're having, academia is having a field day, you know, using ERM by, and, and sort of, uh, exploring how that relates to other theoretical uh, constructs, you know, and, and um, I'm fortunately partly to blame here. I've, I've done something along those lines. So yeah, and if take anything and, you know, put that together with uh, ERM and you have a potential paper, you know, and it seems to be endlessly, you know, very flexible and you can, yeah, tweak it in, in so many ways. Um, there's the thing then, in my view, ERM has great potential value. You might not have gotten that impression up, up to this point, but, but yes, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to endorse something like ERM. I mean, if it's, um, but it's down to, to some of the details, how you do it and, and, and what you uh, focus on. I mean, I think that a main part of the value here is some, having some kind of a risk culture where risk management ends up being a, a core value of some sort. We really commit to it. We mean it. We, we are, are going to think of this as part of how we do things in this firm. We're, we're, we define ourselves in terms of being good at a lot of things, but definitely good at risk management. You know, when you get to that level, then that, that, I think that's going to be very um, beneficial overall. And uh, of course, some, some version of risk governance where you you introduce accountability and responsibilities. Uh, you know, how, I find it hard to see how that could be a bad idea. You know, because it, it does it does happen that people sometimes neglect things because they think somebody else is dealing with it. And, and just these clarifications of roles and responsibilities should definitely be a, a good thing. And risk management can absolutely help close the risk information gap. That we're not as frequently surprised anymore because we we had good high quality information at hand at all in you know in all quarters of the company even the highest levels you know the firm they, they have the relevant information in a timely fashion you know so so there's uh, the, as a consequence there are, there are a few surprises and definitely you can eliminate some negative effects from silos on risk management decisions there is no doubt about this you know if, if you allow people to organize themselves you know, into silos and, and delegate risk management to them, they will pursue more narrow goals and as opposed to the firm-wide cost benefits of the perspective. You can much more easily have cases of over and under management um, in the absence of something like enterprise risk management. Uh, I think it happens uh, quite easily that uh, you, because you have narrow goals and you're chasing a target, you, you can, you know, <laughs> easily uh, have too little risk management or, or too much of it in other contexts, you know, because you're not trying to protect the goal. And, and I think it's very legit to try to work systematically to avoid that sort of situation as part of a, an ERM program. And you, if you're able to provide decision support for managers, like this is the current risk profile, this is what happens if you implement this policy, then we're talking some pretty serious value because we're not talking, what if you as a manager choose to do something different than, than the current sort of course of action? Then that brings a lot of interest and, and has a lot of value because we can see now the potential consequences before we commit to any action. That has to be valuable in my view. And a few more words about uh, some of these. I mean, risk culture is uh, the crucial com component here. Will you take it seriously and commit to it and, and, and make it a, a, some kind of core value? I mean, that's um, this the so called managerial buy in is, is still super relevant. It's going to, to drive a lot of the other elements of an ERM program. If, if, it, if you don't have that commitment, if you don't have the belief that it's actually and fundamentally good, and you just do it as a sideshow, you know, I mean, it all. That is quickly here. So if you have a risk culture, then a lot of good things start happening without you having to be there to, to impose it on people or require them. They, they do it out of a out of a concern for, for the firm's well-being, right? And, and they're basically good at detecting spotting risks as they emerge, you know, and as, when circumstances change, they they risk they evaluate the risks in, in the new sort of uh, environment and they are encouraged to, to to think in terms of risk and report that and be so proactive about them and managers who, who are 
presented with this kind of information, they do something about it. They choose to act on it. It just doesn't just sit on a shelf and they don't intimidate people to be quiet about potential threats, right? So, so here we have a situation where the buy-in is of, of essence, you know, and if you have a high quality vision of ERM along this buy-in, then we're, then we're talking, then we're in business, then ERM can make a real difference and be a force for change and a force for good. Uh, so it start, starts start with risk management as core value, which sort of uh, breeds a risk culture and that drives value because you make better decisions, you're more proactive. Whereas if you're not core value, it becomes this isolated silo that just ticks off boxes and, and uh, you know, just trying to look responsible to, to whoever, <laughs> uh, you know, came up with those expectations. So two very different versions here of, of VRM. And we do have to do something about the, the, uh, this potential excessive focus on short-term goals and short-term KPIs. If, if ERM is framed in that way, we're, we're not going to uh, have a very successful attempt at managing risk overall, I think. Um, it should rather be uh, a long-term perspective in, in risk management. Like we're, we're trying to keep the firm safe and sound for the long for the long term and make decisions that are value enhancing in, the, in from that point of view. And, and chasing short term targets and having a high pressure on that is, is uh, contrary to that goal, you know, and, and you, you might pressure people into reckless behavior or, so that they compromise their standards. Maybe they're paying lip service to the idea of being a good corporate citizen, but, but their actions are, are not aligned with that. So we have to be very careful with these, um, targets, how, they, how they're set, because they drive up the temperature in the firm and, and you know, could potentially bring about a lot of uh, negative consequences down the road. All right, so um, we should get back to, to uh, looking at costs and benefits of risk management. It's essentially an investment decision. Um, if you invest in risk management, you get certain benefits, but there are certain costs too. And then we just have to make sure that the benefits are, are large. And you can get an indication of that by quantifying probability and, and impact. A lot of people find it hard and object to it, but that's what you actually need because together, if you take them, the product cost and impact of, of, of uh, these risk factors, that's the cost of risk. And that indicates the scope of, for, for value creating risk management. I mean, if you can spend uh, up to that point, you know, uh, up to the limit set by the cost of risk, and as long as you spend less on risk mitigation, you can you have a good case for for um, creating value. You're, you're getting more benefits than than you're sp spending resources. So we we have to be quantitative here and connect things to the bottom line and and trade these costs against benefits. That 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 would be a, an improvement in many cases. And and we're looking to create better decisions and create some value. And KPI achievement are not necessarily always. Um, the way to do that. I mean, there, there's a certain tension here, even though the KPIs are, are official and they're sort of legit in that sense, we have to look out for these um, conflicts here where, where KPI achievement, you know, the desire to achieve KPIs is, is driving bad risk management decisions. So, so we, we should be systematic about identifying over and under management of risk rather. I mean, where do we go wrong? Where, where can we, if we map out our risks and risk management activities that, uh, that way instead? Or the traditional risk map, you know, maybe we find some interesting discussions, you know, that okay, here seems like we're spending way too much money, there are the proportion to any benefits, you know, and, and uh, you know, that kind of discussion, which can be very productive. And ERM has to become more financial, in my view, uh, before it can get strategic. Uh, you have, that, that, that's how you bring a lot of value to the rest of the organization. If you're getting very good at expressing risk and return in financial terms and, and connect decision-making to that. So that, again, this point that when managers take actions and make decisions, that has an impact on the risk return profile. If ERM can be there and illustrate this and, and describe what happens to risk, that is a, a pretty solid decision support and, and great value uh, to the organization. And uh, this is referred to as risk budgeting, uh, where you look at risks in, in revenue and um, how that relates to your cost structure. You have things like natural hedges and flexibility and operating leverage. 
all these things that are hugely important determinants of risk, but the, they are often neglected in, in, in the uh, ERM process because they go for these individual risk factors rather than rather than this uh, broad perspective of the firm's performance as viewed through the lens of uh, financial performance. And in, in that setting, it's very natural to think about these natural hedges and when you can exit a cost position, et cetera, and get a much better grip on, on your actual risk profile and how that relates to decision-making. That's when you start getting strategic, but, but it takes some financial, <laughs> financial numbers to get there. You have to be comfortable expressing uh, risk and return through, through that, right? So, and we now have a chance then, if we're able to relate uh, strategic decision-making to uh, the firm's overall risk return profile, well then definitely we're, we can be proactive about strategic uh, decision-making and, and um, that complements the risk register. I mean, the risk register is the, the main sort of output of, of uh, most risk ERM programs today. And that's uh, the, the workhorse, if you will, and it does bring a lot of value. Uh, presumably, I mean, we, we get attention on a, lot, a lot, on a lot of the risks that matter. But it's not enough. We have to have something more to be truly strategic, uh, to aggregate that up to a, to a level where you connect financials and strategic decision making, you know, and, and uh, that's when you're truly holistic and you're truly able to create value for your organization. All right, thank you so much for listening. I'll, I'll end, uh, I'll finish this presentation with uh, this uh, wonderful uh, screensaver here from Ekinor where all the employees of the organization are met with this message. I understand and manage my risk. That's promoting a risk culture. And uh, yeah, I think it's a very nice illustration of, of how you can visually work with visual means to promote uh, a risk culture. All right, thanks for listening and uh, have a good day.